Welcome to the Advent Calendar House, the podcast that's about to be taken over by a wealthy rival who has nothing better to do, so enjoy this while it lasts. It's been a wonderful Christmas in July, and it's time to wrap up our celebration in the most meta way possible by covering a Christmas special about putting on a Christmas special. So light up your microphone-shaped fireworks and join us as we jump out of space and time back to 1992 for It's a Wonderful Tiny Toons Christmas Special. We're tiny, we're toony, we're all a little loony, and very, very soony, Christmas will be here. I am a moderate amount of loony, Mike Westfall. And joining me is a cartoon work of art. It's Chad Young. Hello, Chad. Hello, Mike, and I'm feeling quite loony and toony as well. So. Oh, good. Wouldn't have it any other way. Mm-hmm. No, sir. Also here, having descended from a star on a mission from God himself, please welcome William Bruce West. Hello, Will. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And the world's most adorable allergy-prone Scrooge, it's Adam Pope. Hey, Adam. Oh, yes, indeed. And I proudly display my diploma from Acme University everywhere I go. Of course. Just keep it in your sleeve pocket. Thank you all for being here. I've been saving this one for a while, but I don't think I realized till prepping for this episode that this was sort of a series finale for Tiny Toon Adventures. But let's hear about your history with this series in general and this episode in particular, and we will start with Will. I loved this show. Um, I know like a lot of our demographic, they grew up with like Looney Tunes and things like that. I didn't like Looney Tunes. Like, first off, like I've said on many podcasts that like I didn't grow up with cable. So Mm -hmm. like I knew that Looney Tunes came on cable. But when I finally saw it, I was kind of like, how's this different from Merry Melody, (laughs) which is basically syndicated (laughs) Looney Tunes, you know? So it was like I felt really let down. So, like, those cartoons didn't really do much for me. You know, there's, like, the questionable cultural stuff, and now they're all, like, edited and stuff. So it took Steven Spielberg for me to gain an appreciation for the Warner Brothers catalog. So, like, Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, Tasmania, Pinky and the Brain, Freakazoid, like, all of those. It it starts here at Tiny Toons with Steven Spielberg for me. Will, you didn't like those, like, VHS that were, like, 50 cents at like the hardware <laughs> store that had like 90 hours of awful, awful public domain Bugs Bunny. No. And the worst drawing of him on the cover. Yes, yes. Or or the like Fleischer Superman cartoons that oh. were like public domain or whatever, where all he does is like fight robots. Like I had a ton of those, oh. tons of those tapes. <laughs> like, oh, 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 my stomach. <laughs> well, Chad, tell us about your Tiny Toons history. I love Tiny Toons. Um, I remember it was a very big deal. I was in, uh, I think, first grade when it debuted. So, like, that was an age where I could definitely appreciate, like, a cartoon like this dropping. If I was, like, in sixth grade, can you imagine, like, me trying to convince my friends to, oh, my gosh, you guys, you wouldn't believe it. Tiny Toons dropped. Yes, I can, because I was in sixth grade. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. And it went about as well as you are imagining. So, I'm, uh, this is all just uh, things I I don't tell my therapist, by the way. But um, <laughs> I, I remember really being into it. Um, I'm gonna kind of take something Will said. T- Looney Tunes wasn't the biggest deal in my house. Like my family, I think was more Disney. So when this came yeah. along, I was much more into it. But I we 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 still liked Looney Tunes, but Tiny Tunes was a much bigger deal because it was kind of like the the, um, the Yo Yogi and the Scooby Doo. Uh, Yo Yogi, the, the pup named Scooby Doo, and like yep, all those other things. So this was kind of cool. This was kind of a fresh new idea, and it was a little bit smarter. I actually had um, a plush of the uh, Furball, the cat. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, I had that, and I, I loved that thing. I don't know where it went, but <laughs> yeah, I was a, I was a Tiny Toons fan for sure, absolutely. Adam, what about you? 
Oh, I, I, this is blasphemy to me because I loved me some Looney Tunes. I remember the Bugs Bunny and Tweety show would play. I think it was on ABC or something. Like yeah, Saturday the morning, mornings. Saturday morning. Yeah, yep. so, so I was watching them all the time, but I actually you know knew i knew bugs bunny i loved all those characters but i heard about tiny true adventures in the bugs bunny 50th anniversary magazine oh which he's oh. showing us yeah so in 1990 that came out that was his big anniversary and there was a whole article in there with it was an interview with steven spielberg where he was talking about this tiny tune adventures show that he was producing it showed the character designs like so i got super excited and it started playing uh, on the local Fox affiliate in my area. And I know Will has a little trivia about that that he often likes to share. But, oh. but in my area, that was the affiliate that was carrying it from the beginning. And the Happy Meal toys then came out. And I was I was in all the way after that. And especially, you guys were talking about, you know, being in sixth grade. I remember specifically, like... The Tiny Toon Adventures theme song was like an instant way to make a connection in elementary school. Like one morning, I remember distinctly, we're waiting for the teacher to let us into the classroom. Someone just started singing, they're tiny, they're tootie. And we <laughs> all joined in until there was like this huge <laughs> choir of children just being silly. We're screaming out the lyrics in unison. Like, And, and this episode has a, a big connection to the theme song in a lot of ways, which I can't wait to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it was, it was just always there. And I, I loved everything about it. The reimagining really worked for me and for my sensibilities. And I felt like it was a fantastic just update with the same sensibility that I don't know that they've ever captured again in all the other attempts to bring the Looney Tunes and make them modern. I feel like this one for its time is the one that worked the best. Absolutely. What's this bit of trivia that Will has that you were talking about? If it's the one I think he's talking about, <laughs> it's like <laughs> how, um, like folks our age always think about Tiny Toons and they always think back to like Fox Kids and things like that. Yeah. But people don't realize Tiny Toons, at least that first season, wasn't meant for kids. Like it was like families could watch it, kids could watch it, but it launched in first run syndication, weekend syndication. And like in different markets, like what it was packaged with varied. But like here in D.C., it was packaged with this show called What a Dummy, which is about this <laughs> dummy that comes to life. Yep. And it's like a live action sitcom. And at times sure. it was packaged with Harry and the Hendersons, that live action series. But like this, it, it eventually becomes known as a kid show. But this is almost like another take on The Simpsons in that like kids could enjoy it. But those jokes, if you look at the first 13 episodes, mm -hmm. kids don't get those pop culture references. Like I got them because I lived on Entertainment Tonight. Yeah. But like <laughs> they're making a lot of like inside jokes about Hollywood that you would really have to you would need a subscription to Entertainment Weekly and or Vanity Fair to keep up <laughs> with the jokes in season one of Tiny Toons. So, like, no one ever remembers that. They just remember, like, oh, yeah, I remember when it was on Fox Kids. And that's kind of like my litmus test. It's like if you ask someone who killed Batman's parents, if they say the Joker, I just walk away. So <laughs> That's what I'll say. <laughs> yeah, the crazy thing about it, too, I think, is just like, um, you know, growing up in Southern California, like also, I think there was like a connection there. And I think that's why it was on the Fox affiliate for me from the start, because it's probably like Steven Spielberg's like, we want to be able to see this. He's probably they're probably pushing it out there like I'm in L.A. I want my kids to be able to watch this. Like they, want, they don't have to hunt for it or something like that. But but I just think it, it's strange to me that it had such a short run. Yeah. It feels like it ran forever. But really, once Animaniacs became a thing, they're like, no, no, Animaniacs is better. And it was ultimately, yeah. you know, like, it, sure. But it was it was just kind of crazy to see. But what I was saying about the update what mm -hmm. Will's point is so perfect, because if you look at the old 30s cartoons, you know, the Mary Melodies, the Looney Tunes stuff, like they would have like Clark Gable show up and his ears would wiggle or whatever, you know, like they'd have all these different star parodies. And that's what they did perfectly over and over again with the stars of the late 80s and early 90s. So I, I, I just love everything about that.
Yeah, my earliest Tiny Toons memories are that afternoon slot on Fox Kids. I don't even know if it was Fox Kids yet, but but it was on four o'clock in the afternoon, which was that sweet spot where I'd already be home from school for almost an hour at that point. So I could park myself in front of the TV and take it all in. So I don't remember it ever, at least not in the Philadelphia area, being marketed as a family show. It was very squarely, uh, this is on in the afternoon when the kids are home so the kids can watch it. No, in D.C., it was Saturday afternoons at like five. Oh, you know? wow. It's like you got Tiny Toons what? and then you got What a Dummy. Yeah, that very first year. Because Fox Kids really hadn't started yet. Like, cause I, I was a charter member of the Fox kids club, but okay. I'm still angry. I left my fanny pack on an Amtrak that had my oh. membership card in it. Oh no. <laughs> oh. no how could you? <laughs> Here's my question. Do you think that Animaniacs was kind of Warner brothers version? Do you think that they wanted to kind of build their own before kids WB came along? Do you think they wanted to kind of build their own Disney afternoon? And maybe they kind of thought this would kind of be the first step. Oh, absolutely. Because I, I didn't really think about that till now. But this was like shortly, very shortly after Disney Afternoon came along. So that would kind of play into it. Yeah, no, all of the timing is right here. Yeah. This episode, however, was a primetime special. It aired December 6th, 1992, a Sunday night on Fox. But I must have caught it some other year in December, because when I checked the TV listings for that night, that was up against what I was actually watching. The Olsen twins into Grandmother's House we go. (laughs) (laughs) Guilty. And we get an Olsen twins reference in this episode. We do. But. Every episode guide still treats this as a regular episode of Tiny Toon Adventures, and if you count it, then this is the final regular episode of that first run. There were two more specials after this, but they were well after it. There was a spring break special in 1994 and a Halloween special in 1995 that they aired during Memorial Day weekend. This episode was written by Sherry Stoner and Deanna Oliver. I've talked about Sherry Stoner before. She was the voice of Slappy Squirrel, and she was Disney's character model for Ariel and Belle. Deanna Oliver I haven't talked about yet, but she, along with Sherry, were regular writers for both Tiny Toons and Animaniacs. Together, they co-wrote the movies Casper and My Favorite Martian. But Deanna Oliver was also the voice of the Brave Little Toaster. So this is who's writing this. And if you want to watch it, good luck. It was on Hulu when I put it on my schedule, and now it's not. I believe this is on Daily Motion. I was just about to say. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's on Daily Motion. If you can handle Daily Motion, I found oh. it hiding on the Internet Archive. Uh-huh. It's at the beginning of a nearly four hour block of random Fox Kids Christmas episodes that Chad had discovered was kind of Frankenstein together from from different tapes. It is because as soon as the Warner or the end credits on Animaniacs ends and like fades out, it immediately fades into Carmen San Diego, but there's also like commercials for Toy Story. Oh. And, and the or Toy Story one. And then it goes into Godzilla, the animated series. And then they have a commercial for Frosted Cheerios. These commercials are all over the place. And there are compilations out there that people will say, Oh yeah, these are from 1989, but they're really like commercials from like 86 and then 88. And, it's a cool thing. Like if you're not like us and you can, you know, spot these things, but like if (laughs) you're just watching it, it doesn't really matter. Well, a little plug for me, I getting an assist from Will recently. Will sent me his childhood power Rangers tapes that he recorded off a TV for years and years. So I literally have in chronological order, All the Fox Kids commercials and intros and outros and bumpers, all that stuff. Wow. You know, Fox Kids TV takeover, all of that in chronological order on my YouTube channel right now. From DC. 
So from the DC area, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you need to send me those links the second you process. I need to see this. They're amazing. And no, no offense to Will, I don't give a shit about the Power Rangers. I want to see those commercials. <laughs> I I need to inject those beautiful local spots into my veins. You'll love it. He's oh. got, how, what are you up to, like, 50? Because at one point, I was devising a project to, like, the, the dog eating his tail kind of deal of, like, okay, he's he's picking out the good stuff, and then I'll, like, critique it, and then you went too fast. You did, like, five <laughs> in one weekend. I know. I'm, I'm already to 1999 at this point. Yeah. So. <laughs> wow. And we're getting into that era, so. I will put those links in the show notes. I will put the link to this Internet Archive <laughs> compilation in the show notes. They're all there. But this episode starts with an extra festive opening theme song. Oh. They added sleigh bells and changed some of the lines, and I don't think I'm a fan. Nope. Really? Nope. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. I did I did like one line. I liked, at Acme University, we trimmed the Christmas tree. Deck the halls and guess what falls and anvil naturally. That part was good. <laughs> That's because that sounds like something you would use as an intro for your show. I mean, probably. <laughs> You're not wrong. Well, and just the very simple we're tiny, we're toony, we're all little loony, and very, very soony. Christmas will be here. Yeah, you know, like. That's fun. Here's Hackney Acres. It's a wonderland of snow. You know, like there's a lot of good stuff in there. <laughs> It took me back to a time when, like, they would really put effort into Christmas specials. So for me, as, as corny and silly as it is, I really adore it. Although, I will say this, because... Oh, come on, I just said I'm on your side. <laughs> no, you are. <laughs> you are. But, like, they they use still the standard character introduction. So it's like they'll change a lyric. They put an original new Christmas bit of animation in from this episode. <laughs> yeah. And then they jump back to the standard animation. And it, that's the only thing it's, it's stitched together in kind of a weird way. It reminds me of the old Simpsons, itchy and scratchy, the movie joke, 53% new footage. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what turned me off about it. Yeah. It's very filmation. Yes. Uh, I feel like filming would do that very much. Yeah. Are they making fun of the Looney Tunes movies of the 70s and 80s that they released oh theatrically that were mostly just old shorts with a little wraparound, you know? Yeah. Those were great, though. What was the Ghostbusters one called? I don't remember. Was it Quackbusters? Quackbusters. Quackbusters that yeah. sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> No, I had because we would we taped them off of HBO. I remember one thousand and one Rabbit Tales and the Looney 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 Bugs Bunny movie where they they're at the Schlosskers or something like that. <laughs> but uh, then this episode, as it starts, they jump right into the "It's a Wonderful Life" parody with the song "Buffalo Gals" playing over the title card. <laughs> can, so can I ask everyone here if you were watching in nineteen ninety two, would you have gotten? The it's a wonderful life thing no, no. i would not have no <laughs> no well i wouldn't have gotten the like because there's some real easter eggs like the buffalo gal song oh like, yeah i wouldn't have gotten that but i mean the it's a wonderful life like trope structure has been used everywhere yes. like every 80s sitcom did the whole like i wish i was never born and then well your wish is my command and then <laughs> yeah. nobody remembers them and then they i want to go back home like it's been done to death so i would have been like okay that's what they're doing but the actual like oh he's this is a jimmy stewart impression yeah. and this is like i would have missed all of that the whole lassoing the moon i would have missed that you know because i didn't watch that movie until i met my wife wow like she watches it every christmas while she wraps presents and we've been together 15 years but like i hadn't seen it prior to that it was that boring black and white movie yep. that came on every year and i would turn the channel you know <laughs> like, so i wouldn't have got it then neither would i yeah no i didn't watch it till i was an adult either i think it was just after watching that Christmas with the Joker one year, it's just like, you know what? I should probably sit down and watch It's a Wonderful Life. I do have a quick question real quick, because Will had pointed out about references. Is there a song in the original It's a Wonderful Life called Buffalo Gals? Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
you know what? So I'm going to take back a comment because I'm sitting here thinking of the Malcolm McLaren song from the 80s. No, 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 that no, no. I was not thinking of, okay, then I I retract my previous statement. Beep it in so I'll look like a dumbass, though. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I, I can't figure out why I won't get asked on any other podcast. So oh, come that. on. <laughs> All right. And that's followed by a road sign that declares you are now in Acme Acres on a very snowy Christmas Eve. That's a reference as we hear several characters praying for their pal Buster. Please help Buster. He's my best friend. Don't leave the mother with Buster. Save him. Don't let anything bad happen to Buster. Including Babs Bunny, Lil Sneezer, and Hampton Pig, who's got a menorah in his window. Oh, I didn't notice that. I missed that one. Yeah. Interesting. I, I do want to mention Plucky's though, because he had the most like meta where he's just like, otherwise Tiny Toons will be canceled and I'll have to work on some chipmunk show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the chipmunks were in between reboot periods in 1990. Right. Mm. The only chipmunk show he'd be on like in 1992 is Rescue Rangers. No, no, Ooh. no, no. No, that was done too by then. No, no. Because we're at this point, don't we still have chipmunks go to the movies? Oh, you're right. Those VHS tape. Yes. Oh, you know what? Yeah, that was hanging by a thread. Yeah. Yeah. The the movie parodies. Cause like on NBC, they were doing like Batmunk and yeah. Honey, I Shrunk the Chipmunks and all that. But this is like the end, you know? But like there's a little overlap there. Just barely, yeah. Mm -hmm. They aired those on network TV. Oh, yeah, the show changed to Chipmunks Go to the Movies. New theme song, new credits, everything for that last season. Yeah. I legit just thought those were all uh, straight to VHS. I had no idea that those were broadcast. No, oh, yeah. they, it was broadcast as, like, separate seasons of Alvin and the Chipmunks is how they're categorized now. But So when they replay these, are they considered, like, do they still... Do they have its own intro, or do they use the old Alvin and the Chipmunk intro? No, they have their own intro. Last I saw, they had their own intro, but I haven't seen that show in syndication in a long time. Because no, like me they just wrapped up the like CGI reboot. That thing mm -hmm. lasted for like seven years. Yeah. So like, is it finally done? Uh, I think I'm pretty sure. <laughs> like okay. it, it's it's like COVID recent, but like I'm yeah. pretty sure it's yeah. finally done. I will mention Hampton, not in this episode, besides this beginning part, where we don't even see him. We just see his house. I notice that menorah in his window, and then that's the last we see of him until, like, the ending song, and it's just everybody singing. So Don Messick got a day off. Did he have a straight-to-video Scooby movie to voice? Is that what we're Probably. <laughs> He's a busy guy. Not anymore. But... Since we actually see Plucky here, I will mention his voice actor, Joe Alasky. Who cares about Buster? Not me. Please take care of him, I beg you! <laughs> Otherwise, Tiny Toons will be canceled so I'll have to work on some chipmunk show. Haven't talked about him in a long time. He did several voices in A Wish for Wings That Work, including ducks that all sounded like Plucky. Oh, I, I always remember Joe Alasky. Whenever I hear that name, it's not animation, but I know he does a ton of voiceover work. He was Uncle Beano on Out of This World. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're right. <laughs> oh, wow. Good call. He was lucky. It's insane to me. Yeah. I always forget about that. So we follow up all of their prayers into the night sky, which looks like the Starry Night painting, which I thought was a nice touch. We even see a hand holding a paintbrush to put the finishing touches on a constellation. It's one of the dippers, probably the big one, but one of the stars floats in from off screen, having been summoned by God himself. It's Harvey the Guardian Angel, and his voice is a Jimmy Stewart impression provided by Dan Castellaneta. Uh, it's time for me, sir. I totally heard Dan Castellaneta. I was like, he, he did voices on Tiny Toons? Like, what's he doing here? I don't think he was a regular voice. I think they just got him in occasionally. It's always weird to hear him pop up because as soon as you kind of make the connection that it's him, it's like, uh, how? Wait, how are you here when you're when you should be kind of doing something? 
I feel like they weren't really getting paid enough for Simpsons in this era uh, because no. they all had side jobs. Yeah. You know, like Hank is there, is still working regularly. Yardley's working regularly. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind, Dan ends up as the genie on the Aladdin cartoon. Yep. That's right. So it's like oh. they, they hadn't gotten that Fox raise yet. No. Mm-hmm. Last time he came up on this podcast was on Hey Arnold. So who was he on Hey Arnold? He was the oh, grandpa. Wait, he was the grandpa. Yeah. Never mind. Please take that part out, at least. I'm keeping it in. He's done another grandpa? What's his other grandpa voice sound like? Now I gotta go check that out. 23 skidoo! (laughs) Oh, gosh. But the voice of God is one I don't think I've covered yet. It's Tony Pope. Harvey, you're gonna have to go down to Acme Acres. Buster Bonnie's thinking of quitting Tiny Toons. And I have to ask Adam, any relation? No relation. Okay, <laughs> I'm actually surprised because that's not the only thing you two have in common. Tony Pope portrayed Goofy, starting in 1979 and through a good chunk of the 80s, including a little song you're familiar with called Watch Out for Goofy. I can't believe it. After all these years, I never knew. Wow. It's your Uncle Tony. The theme song. Yeah, to my Two Goofs podcast. That's awesome. You can also hear Tony Pope on several Disneyland dark rides as the voice of Geppetto in Pinocchio's Daring Journey and the Cheshire Cat and the King of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland. Oh, much better than Tom Hanks, Tony Pope. I'll tell you that much. But wait, there's more. He was also Newton Gimmick from Teddy Ruxpin. Wow. Who was that? The scientist. The guy with the mustache, the the bald guy inventor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, See, I'm sorry. I, I spend so much time focusing on my pet monster. I keep forgetting. Teddy <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of terrifying toys, he was also the terrifying voice of Furby. Oh, no. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention his voice on a radio commercial is the first voice we hear in Back to the Future. You won't find a better car at a better price with better service anywhere in Hill Valley. Now we're talking. My hero now, this guy. (laughs) So he gives God this almost Columbo sounding voice because, sure, I'd love it if God sounded like Grandpa from The Princess Bride. That's something we all would have gotten as kids in 1991. Sure, why not? Grandpa from (laughs) The Princess Bride. I would have gotten it. (laughs) Eh, maybe. Well, then maybe I'm speaking from this. That's what I would have connected it to. I wouldn't have gotten the Columbo, but. I don't think anyone would. Or at least our age. And he tells his angel, Harvey, go down to Acme Acres because Buster Bunny's thinking of quitting Tiny Toons. And to find out why he's considering that, we flash back to earlier that day as Buster and Babs are sledding down a mountain and singing about it's an absolutely perfect fun-filled sleigh ride. We're on an absolutely perfect snowy hillside for an absolutely perfect fun-filled sled ride. Buster is not voiced by Charlie Adler in this episode, but Mm -hmm. by John Kassir, the Crypt Keeper. So odd. Yeah. And Mike. What else did he do? And what else? That Legend of Zelda commercial that I can't shut up about. Zelda! (laughs) I have an interesting... uh, So I met John Kassir, and I brought this up back in 2015. I asked him, because I've always been curious, how did that come to be? And he was just like, yeah, they brought me in, and I called Charlie Adler and made sure he was okay, and he was just like, yeah, go ahead, fuck him, I don't care. (laughs) Get as much money as you can out of those bastards. Because of Apparently, Charlie got, like, screwed. He thought he was getting Animaniacs, and then, oh. you know, he, he, he that's kind of why he walked off. And then they got John, who is a great voice actor, so. Oh, yeah. Makes sense. He also played, he was the Adam in the Justice League of America. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've actually done some work with John Kassir on the Retro Days Halloween specials. Yes, mm. you did. We had him come in, yeah. So our wow, what a get. crypt keeper. We've we've had some back and forth. Uh, and Babs, of course, is Tress McNeil. Mm-hmm. I need a neck rub. Where's Carlos? When was the last time I talked about her? Oh, Animaniacs. <laughs> She's everywhere. Every special you do. Well, close to it, but. Yeah. We also see Santa sledding around this hill as well, but they wasted a perfectly good opportunity to put him on a Norelco razor. It was right there. I don't get that one. Was that a commercial? 
that's a classic commercial from like the 50s, 60s, 70s. That would have fit in really well with all these other references, but uh, they also nearly crash into a parody of the Grinch. All the schmagoos down in Schmagooville. The, the schmagoos in Schmagooville. <laughs> Yes. I kind of wish that the next year they would have done a full Grinch parody. Can oh, you that would have been great. <laughs> the Tiny Toons wrecking the Schmagoos plan, the Grinch, <laughs> whatever they were going to call him. You yeah. Know? Like, I just, I could totally see him getting super annoyed by all the Tiny Toons just buttoning in <laughs> on his gig. Yeah. There's also a Sam the Snowman parody, but he looks like Yosemite Sam the Snowman. <laughs> But they finally reach the bottom of the hill on their sled, which we now see is named Rosebud, of course. That's where it went. And they welcome us to their primetime holiday spectacular with celebrity guest stars galore. Before we hear a voice from off screen shouting, What's going on here? Cut! And we see they're filming on this very small stage in a theater. Thought that was odd. It looks like my kid's school theater. Yeah, I didn't get that. I mean, it's Warner Brothers. They would have an entire sound stage. Why are you shooting on an elementary school stage? Like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense there. I guess the vibe that they were trying to go with was that these are the Tiny Toons. They are like old vaudeville acts. Mm. So we're going to put them on a stage like that. It's the only thing I can think of. It makes sense. But the yelling voice we hear is Montana Max, who rolls in on a wheelchair with one of his legs bandaged up. How dare you start rehearsals without me? Monty, you're late. I was skiing in Aspen with Morgan Fairchild. I had a mishap. Where's my part? (laughs) I don't think any kid would have known Morgan Fairchild at this point. This is well before her old Navy commercials or anything. But... Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, that's where I would have known the face. Sure. No. Didn't they also, didn't they do a, didn't they do a joke like that in the Twilight Zone movie? Probably. Where, like, the, someone said, oh, yeah, I have, like, a date with Morgan Fairchild or something like that. Huh. There was some movie that, like, did that reference as well, so that's the only way I would have known who she is. Uh, The voice of Montana Max is Danny Cooksey. Last time I talked about him on the podcast, he was a little kid flirting with Dolly Parton in a Smoky Mountain Christmas. Yeah, boy. <laughs> uh, one person who's actually excited to see Monty show up is Elmira. Don't you want to kiss me under the mistletoe, Monty? Wanty, cute, cuddly boyfriend head. I was wondering how long did it take for her? Like, was she always a Montana Max antagonist, like love interest? And then they flipped her to be like harassing animals all the time? Or was it concurrent? I feel like it was always at the same time. Okay. I think it was the other way around. I think it was the animals first. And then they decided uh, Montana Max needs a love interest. Throw Elmira in there. They're both humans. (laughs) Who knows? (laughs) They got that call from PETA. And they were like, <laughs> have her drop the cats. Yeah, she doesn't bother any of the animals here at all. It's nope. all Monty. Now, did they drop the the animal thing before or after she had a little bow tie with the skull? Because I've always been curious where that skull came from. Wasn't it always there? It wasn't always there. So I was reading about this. So what they did with that, that was supposed to be like in, in the universe when they first introduced her. There's like this Mr. Skullhead it's character. It's the Mr. Like, Skullhead show. Yeah. Starring him, Mr. Skullhead. Oh, the one from like Animania or that they would do later. And so it started there, then they moved it into uh, the Animaniacs. They kind of expanded him and made him like a full character. Yeah. He was good idea, bad idea guy. Yeah. Okay. Because I always took that as like, it was like an animal skull or something oh, or no. like maybe she yeah that's how i was <laughs> talking as a kid i was like did she is that where that skull came from like it, i mean she is supposed to be the tiny tunes equivalent of elmer fudd so maybe wait a minute oh for fucks i'm just figuring we just taught chad something <laughs> all these years fucked up i'm done Oh, yeah. (laughs) And he's out. Wow. (laughs) I never caught that either. It's okay, (laughs) Chad. There was an episode when they all, when like everybody at Acme University got mentors and uh, Elmer was Elmira's and that's when I caught it. Like they had to explain it to me. So unless, I guess unless anybody else saw that, 
if, if you missed that episode, yeah, you probably would have missed it until right now. But I'm fuming over that. <laughs> I thought they just did it because they were human. Like they were segregating them. Like you can't be with tunes. <laughs> flesh with flesh. Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, I have a question. Speaking of things that we learned in this episode. So I I recently watched the first few episodes of the reimagining the Acme Luniversity on Max. Okay. And and I it made me realize that back in the 90s, I mean, if they're at a Luniversity, they are they supposed to be college students? Because obviously they act like elementary school kids, but they're at a university. And so it's kind of strange because in the reimagining, they're going to college. Like it's like a college oh, series. Okay. Yeah, mm. but the reimagining does so many things wrong. We can't we can't acknowledge it. The biggest sin being Buster and Babs as siblings. Yeah. Yeah. Hate that. Ew, what? They are the yes relation. Yeah. <laughs> they killed the main joke. They, yeah. <laughs> I was so good as they're supposed they're all supposed to be child actors. I feel like it's very fluid where they are. Like it's it's mm. called Acme Luniversity because somebody made that pun and decided, ooh, that's good. Yeah, Put it right. in the song. <laughs> but the actual age, I think, is very fluid. It just depends on what jokes they need for that day. Yeah. Elmira, of course, is voiced by Cree Summer. I was just talking about her. She was a voice in the Pillow People Save Christmas. That was the last time she came up on here. Monty boots her off set and asks about two people with clipboards sitting in the theater. And Buster informs him they're the TV executives who are allowing them to do this primetime special. So Monty immediately takes out a big wad of cash and tells them, buy yourself a real network. No, I was going to say I wouldn't have gotten any of that as a kid. Just here, I'm rich. Go away. No. It's kind of in the vein of like early Simpsons, though, where it's like nobody beat up on Fox more than Fox shows. That's oh, yeah. true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so it was like it. that was definitely the era, too, where it's like you're biting the hand that feeds you. But that shows you're edgy. Like basically every Fox sitcom was the stone cold Steve Austin <laughs> on Fox. Like <laughs> They hated their boss. They poured beer on him, but he kept paying them because sure. people love them. Like, I feel like it started with Married with Children and they just opened the floodgates. Yep. Didn't HBO do that a few times with their shows, too? Like, didn't a few. I'm sure. Yeah. I I feel like Dream On or I know Tales from the Crypt probably did, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But see, it's hard to do that when people are paying to watch you. Right. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like like it's a different like class structure. Fox is free. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, yep. <laughs> So Monty asks what his part is in the special, but Buster tells him he didn't think he'd show up, and Plucky pokes his head out from off screen and explains, so he wrote you out. And he's about to throw a tantrum, but thinks the better of it in front of these TV execs. So he wheels himself off stage and says, oh, don't mind me, adding under his breath, don't mind me ruining it. And a boy. (laughs) <laughs> so we move on in the script to, and Plucky excitedly enters dressed as Plucky the Red Pink Dream Duck. Plucky, didn't you get the rewrites? The new pages are yellow, see? Now it's Urkel the Red Nosed Rain Dude. <laughs> Which we don't get to see, and that's a crime. Yeah, but, and we got that horrible Urkel Christmas. Yeah, that took 31 years to pay off that line. Terrible. <laughs> And I was happier when I'd forgotten about it. I feel like Reginald Bell Johnson is understanding Plucky's plight. He's like, Urkel, Urkel, no! <laughs> yeah. Taking my stage, taking yeah. my screen time. Oh, yeah. No, instead, we're treated to a scene from Ebenezer Sneezer, and the curtain opens to reveal Lil Sneezer dressed as Scrooge in his big four poster bed. Why is Sneezer Scrooge? Just because it rhymes? Yeah. So I have a sneezer, like you said, the puns win every time. Yeah. Over logic. I'm scared of you, ghost. Hey, this kid's cuter than those twins on that Saget show. Sneezer is voiced by Kath Susie. Her last appearance on this podcast was as Kanga in Winnie the Pooh. So I have a question because yeah. for some reason I, I may have had a Mandela effect. I feel like before, it's been ages since I've watched Tiny Toons. I always remember... It may have been wrong. I thought she had voiced a character that was like, I mean, I can say this because I am whatever, but okay. I I feel like there was a manic 
kind of bipolar character that would just start yelling and screaming. Are you thinking of Katie Kaboom? That wasn't her, was it? Is that it? Is that I what think I'm that's thinking? the character you're talking that's about? That's Animaniacs. But like, yeah. okay, then maybe that then I'm mixing them up. But for some reason, I thought the um, either the skunk or who was the weird hippie girl. I thought one of those was like it's not Shirley because Shirley's in this. Yeah, I know. Cap had a second character. Yes, here I'm looking it up now. Yeah, she voices Fifi La Fume. Okay, then maybe I'm just mixing everything together. Yeah, she's not like manic or anything. She's she's the Peppy Le Pew skunk character who's like romantic. I must be remembering it wrong because I thought that there was a like a character that would just like go off the handle so quickly on this show. And it must be something else that I'm thinking of. I mean Montana Max, but Elmira would go off pretty quickly. It wasn't Maybe. always just like fuzzy wuzzies. Yeah. Like she she could drop on a dime to just kind of get a little scary. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of for some reason. Maybe I'm just grouping like 50 characters on this show into one. I mean, it's easy to do. Because Elmira has a dose of like Kathy Bates and misery to her. You <laughs> yeah, know? It's dies. like it's it's a it's a thin line she can cross, and when mm-hmm. she crosses it, it changes everything. Yeah. Okay, then maybe that's what I'm thinking. Uh, I, I think that maybe that's the connection I was making. Great pickup on the Kathy Bates yeah. and misery. <laughs> so I what love. I do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh but little sneezer. Not even the focus of this scene. That belongs to the first of our fake celebrity cameos, Bob Hope as the Ghost of Christmas Past. Hey, hi, I'm the Ghost of Christmas Past. I tell you, I've seen so many past Christmases, I gave camel riding lessons to the three wise men. I feel like all comedy writers of like the 80s and 90s were just fed up with Bob Hope. Like they had been force fed <laughs> Bob Hope all throughout their childhood. So like, we are going to burn this guy to the ground. <laughs> and we hated him because he preempted our favorite shows. Yeah. It's like, we didn't have appreciation for the troops and stuff at that age. So it's like, <laughs> why is he in Iraq? I want to see Empty Nest. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The only movie I like Bob Hope in is the Muppet movie. <laughs> he was in the Muppet movie? He yeah, he was. was the ice cream man. You know what? I, I feel like Bob Hope is like, to me, and again, this is going to sound blasphemous. I feel like he's like the Three Stooges where I just grew up thinking, this feels old and unfunny. But to like so many other people, like this is like comedy, like god level oh, yeah. and i'm just like oh yeah no, he was the one where it's accurate he was old and unfunny yeah. but, he, <laughs> but three stooges like had the decency to like quit and or die off like oh, they got god. to the point they were dragging bob out to these war zones to oh my goodness the yeah. troops and you're yeah. like this who insured this trip like this was a bad <laughs> idea in many ways yeah. they have him in a box at a cargo uh jet just He's like in Acting Be Nuts and all. He was on a Simpsons episode. <laughs> Fall out, Bob Hope. I do feel bad, though, because nobody has filled that void. You can't say like, oh, Dane Cook's on his 400th trip to Iraq to entertain the troops. <laughs> I mean, he'd do it. Like, no one stepped in. Like, I don't know what the USO does these days. Jimmy Fallon will do it eventually, or James Corden, but it should it's probably gonna be mm. Jimmy Fallon. It can't be Corden, he's a red coat. Uh, that's what I was gonna say. He's not <laughs> he's not American. Say <laughs> hey, he can't go over there. Uh it's Maurice Lamarche doing Bob Hope's impression here. There we go. God bless him. With canned laughter provided by Go Go Dodo out of a soup can. <laughs> I, I want that to be sold on Etsy. I want people to be selling me canned laughter and booze in a can. <laughs> right. How is that not readily available? It probably is. Yeah. Gogo, of course, is Frank Welker in his Slimer uh, range. Gogo, you got the new yellow pages? Sure. I had to ask, didn't I? Wow, we haven't heard from Frank Welker since Animaniacs either. How'd that happen? That can't be possible. Frank Welker's literally in every cartoon ever created. He's even in those weird, those that VHS that we were talking about earlier. Or somehow, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> it was in a flight of cartoons. It is like, it's it's a contractual thing. It's like the Welker Claws. Like, he's got to do something <laughs> in every animated feature. What show were we talking about, Adam, where it was like, 
I don't even remember at this point because we've had 15 episodes. Hey. But, uh, there was, I always said it got to a point in Frank Welker's career where it, it was based on the Slimer scale. Like, he yeah. go into an interview yeah. and they're like, we want about a seven on the Slimer scale. And he's <laughs> like, say less. <laughs> he knows the assignment. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, Montana Max makes his first move as he wheels his wheelchair up a step ladder, which is very impressive upper body strength. Mm -hmm. But he goes up a level so he can sprinkle pepper flakes down on old Sneezer to make him do the thing. And his monstrous sneeze sends the entire set falling down on him. One of the TV execs, the short bald guy, loves this, but the larger woman next to him is not amused. Not even after Sneezer pokes his head out and says, God bless me, everyone. With a line like that, you'd think this was the part of the act and Monty's involvement meant nothing. He's just a quick thinker, that little Sneezer. Yeah, yup. Right off the top of the noggin. Uh, these two executives are later named Edward and Fran. Edward is voiced by Joe Alasky. <laughs> now this is good. You are so lost, Edward. Yes, I am. Fran is Valerie Bromfield, the original voice of Tender in The Gift of Winter, Chad. Uh-huh. Hey, by the way, this is a good time to remind everyone that Mike and I are mechanically <laughs> citizens of any time in the USA. That's right. We are. She tells Buster to get it together, and we move on to... Plucky, the lonely fruitcake nobody wanted for Christmas. Pink pages, Plucky. Now it's Urkel, the lonely fruitcake. Oh, great. And we are again denied. <laughs> Plucky walks off stage, upset. He's been cut out of another scene, past Luke Perry for no reason. I do not look like James Dean. Could you put my collar up higher and put more grease on my hair? So, right, Rob Paulson doing Luke Perry, right? You yeah. Can, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Just for no reason other than he was in the building. Hey. Do an impression of someone famous. Rob Paulson's not really an impersonator. That's a that's the best part. Is he's he's not an impersonator. No, he's not. <laughs> it's in his skill set, but it's not what he's known for. No, like God bless him. I am a massive Rob Paulson. Fan, oh yeah, but he only has a real. Most of these voice actors, and this is gonna sound. Oh gosh, I hope no voice actor is listening to this right now. No one listens to this. Who's famous? But most voice actors have one voice and they're just kind of able to manipulate that one voice. So like Cam Clark, again, who I'm a huge fan of, Towns to Coleman. That's the talent, though. That is. Absolutely. I'm not going to argue that. But what I'm saying is you can usually tell when you hear Rob Paulson trying to do an impression awfully quick. Yes. No. Uh, but but Cam Clark, Liquid Snake, sounding like Snoopy and Leonardo. I'm fine with that. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> This is my Rob Paulson autograph. I hey, got it. Wow. Retrocon like five or six years ago. Yeah. Well done. So what's next? It's an ice skating sketch called a Cher and Cher alike featuring Babs dressed like Cher and actual Cher. But of course, it's Tress McNeil voicing both with the exact same voice. So it's delightful. They say we share and share alike. That means I borrow whatever Babs will lend. I share with you, you share with me, but that doesn't mean I loan you my boyfriend. Was it, wasn't Cher in like an ice skating sketch? Or no, I think it was, no, it was Charo in Pee Wee's Christmas. She didn't ice, no, no, it was Little Richard doing the ice skating. Or not doing the ice skating. Oh, well, then this is even more awkward than Jesus. Yeah, no, Charo's in the Pee Wee Christmas special. <laughs> we went from Cher to Charo to Little Richard. <laughs> this is the worst love boat ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, thank you for saving me there, Will. <laughs> so Buster walks up to them and says, wow, you look great. And Bab says, thank you. But Buster ignores her and keeps talking to the real Cher. No. Meanwhile, Monty wheels himself over to Babs and says, look at Buster flirt with her. How can you stand it? Admit it, you're jealous. Which she denies before turning to us and admitting, but can you blame me if I am? But again, the share and share alike song they sing makes it look like part of the show. So Monty's goading doesn't mean anything. No. Yeah. It's also just odd that the premise of the song, yeah, is that Cher wants to date. 
but like she she's telling bab she's like i'm gonna date your boyfriend like it's pretty much literally said in the song and you're like what <laughs> a share there's a certain level of hotness where you don't follow society's rules. <laughs> you told her her intentions, and she, she that was a courtesy. She didn't have to do that. She could have just oh. stole Buster. But like, she she's like, I know you're new to this. We'll be over here, babe. <laughs> it's a more aggressive version of the sister song from uh, White Christmas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so instead... Monty dumps a bunch of piranhas in a water under the ice and cuts a hole for Cher to fall through. That's apparently another ruined sketch, and Buster's getting real upset real quickly. Plucky's dressed for his next sketch and rightly expects to get cut as well, but no, Buster tells him, you're on, little drummer duck. And now he's ecstatic. He tells the TV execs, prepare yourselves for a dynamite performance. And that's exactly what Monty is preparing for. So he replaces the stage microphones with sticks of dynamite. (laughs) You know, the dynamite stick that looks like a microphone. (laughs) As this rendition of the little drummer boy is quote unquote sung to us by Maurice LaMarche as William Shatner. Come, they told the duck, a rumpa pum pum. Ugh. I so I, I have to do a quick side note. Okay, there was a point in, in around this time. I feel like everybody was just in a hurry to tear apart William Shatner, and sometimes it was very well justified. But whenever I think of a William Shatner impression, my mind always goes to Maurice. Yeah, and I mean they also did one uh, in Animaniacs where he did his uh shatner impression and it was just hilarious but yeah i feel like this was around the time it, it was like when will was or i think it was will that said it people were just ready to make fun of bob hope i feel like people were also in a hurry to make fun of william shatner too well this is when the memoirs started coming out because oh. keep in mind 91 91 was the 25th anniversary. Yeah. And at that point, they're all putting their books out. And that's when we really first discover they all hated Shatner. (laughs) (laughs) We didn't know that before. Like the cracks start to show when he's directing Star Trek V, but they all (laughs) hated Bill Shatner. So, like, any chance they could talk about he was fat or he wore a toupee (laughs) or whatever, people went in because Mm -hmm. it was chum in the water. Yup. And this is this is new then. Now it feels like old hat. But it was kind of shocking at that point in time. That makes a lot more sense now. Yeah, I didn't. I completely forgot. Like that's around the time. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Well, perfect. But the mics explode. Of course, we can't have a duck explosion without his bill getting blown off. That lands on Shatner's head, and while Shat's toupee lands on Plucky's head, and then he storms over to Buster and tells him, "I quit," followed by everybody else quitting including Shirley the Loon. I don't know what she's so mad about. Yeah, the set collapsed on her when Sneezer sneezed, but then we saw her styling Luke Perry's hair and she seemed fine. Did she like read tarot cards in other episodes? Yes. So Shirley the Loon is voiced by Gail Mathias. Like, I've never seen Blue Boy that down before. Oh, with SNL. That's someone I haven't talked about before. Yeah, from SNL, she co-anchored Weekend Update with Charles Rocket. Oh. Which I only bring up because Charles Rocket was on my last episode I did on Quantum Leap. Ooh. But she had a regular character on SNL called the Valley Girl, Valley Girl Vicky. So that's where Shirley's voice comes from. That's right. Her other best known voice role, I imagine, is as the mom on Bobby's World, don't you know? Oh, yeah. I always thought that was what's her name? Um, Edie McClurk. No, it's it's Gail Mathias because that was another character she would do. Yeah, and uh, one thing I want to put about Shirley the Loon, I think she's also partly supposed to be like Shirley McLean, who is known for being very new agey, and I think oh. they were kind of fun at her as well. Yeah. Oh, that would make huh. sense. Shirley McLeany. <laughs> Don't start, Mike. Don't you dare start. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Don't. Don't do it. But yeah. Everyone's mad at Buster now. Go-Go trades his canned laughter for canned booze, and they all walk out on him. 
Even Cher, who has the worst aged line in this thing. I gave up. It's a Cosby family Christmas to do this. <laughs> Woof. Dodged a bullet there, Cher. Yeah, yeah really. Just, 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 just. All the other celebrities we've seen start complaining as well until Fran the exec shouts quiet from behind a very large pile of money and announces Montana Max is now in charge. And then we see Buster just walk off very sadly saying, sorry, I failed you guys. And now the others realize, oh, I think we hurt his feelings by quitting. So Babs asks the others, what should we do? And Shirley suggests, maybe we should meditate on this or some junk. She means pray. <laughs> That's what she means. Right, right. <laughs> Probably not. Both appear to work since God summons Harvey to do something. He asks Harvey if he has any questions, and his first question is, Uh, yeah, uh, how, how come he's, he's not wearing any pants? Harvey. <laughs> that was so good. I loved it. We don't get an answer because God realizes, oh no, Buster's about to walk past the sign that says danger, one more step and you are out of the picture, and behind that sign is a white glow behind the edge of a film strip. <laughs> Buster steps out on the very edge, says goodbye, cruel series, and we go to commercial there. And yeah, the copy we watched kept the commercial. So, Chad, you were talking about the first commercial was for Godzilla, the series based on the 98 mm -hmm. movie. He can outswim a torpedo, tear through rock, leap hundreds of feet into the air. The most terrifying lizard of them all is back. But this time he bonds with biologist Nick Katopoulos. Swim away! Catch Godzilla, the series, tomorrow morning at 9, only on Fox Kids. The holidays are here, Hooray! so hold on tight. It's party time, Woody. Watch your step and get ready to meet new friends. I come in peace. As Walt Disney Pictures presents the comedy that has everyone laughing. Snap out of it! And everyone asking, What is it? It's the most fun you'll have at the movies this year. You gotta believe me. Toy Story. Hey, watch it! Rated G. Now playing at a theater near you. Check newspaper for showtimes. Remember that show back. Hello, TV lovers. We want to know if you remember that show? The Retro Network's newest nostalgia-filled podcast that will have you flipping the channels of your memories and discovering vintage entertainment that's gotten lost in the static of years gone by. We're your hosts and we want to introduce ourselves. I'm Adam Pope. And I'm William Bruce West. Each month on Remember That Show, we will discuss a different obscure or forgotten TV show from the 80s or 90s that we love, hate, or want to debate. We'll be reliving some of our favorite TV moments from the good old days and occasionally cracking the lenses of our rose-colored glasses. It's all happening here on the Retro Network. So remember, when you're looking for the best in nostalgic entertainment, you just have to ask yourself one question. Remember that show. These current, I'm sorry, yeah, but like when you have a TV spot for the first Toy Story, which was a very popular movie in Christmas '95, Thanksgiving yeah. Christmas '95, yeah. and then you jump to a bunch of cartoons and spots from like '99, it's just every disorder I have was just set off <laughs> so badly. I could, I, I was, I was so furious. I was like, nope. Please don't do this. <laughs> but, but you also see the quality drop, too. Because, like, with the yes. Godzilla one, like, the, the commercial's like, the Godzilla's back, and this time he's bonded with Dr. Tor Torgelson. <laughs> I'm supposed to know who that guy is. You know, right. is that Matthew Broderick's character? from? I don't remember, but it's just kind of like, Godzilla was the kind of cartoon you got it was like a richard rainus good cartoon <laughs> that you got like weekday syndication <laughs> with like yeah. extreme ghostbusters that yes. was yep. not a fox kids you should wake up saturday mornings nope. to watch this. no this is fox getting whatever they can get for cheap mm -hmm. at this point because the, the the wheels are falling off so that's what made me sad you know like <laughs> the production value and just the oh. things they're picking up at this point yeah oh terrible but we come back from commercial with Buster about to jump off the ledge of reality and God himself is sending a guardian angel to stop him. And Harvey the angel makes his entrance by dropping down and hanging on the edge of the celluloid till Buster pulls him up. 
and Harvey is revealed to also be a cartoon bunny. I'm your guardian tune, Angel. Yeah, and I'm Frank Capra. See you around. I, who is that? No kid gets that joke. That's the director of It's a Wonderful Life. Well, is is joke on joke because Jimmy Stewart was in Harvey where the guy has the imaginary rabbit. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's like it's a Jimmy Stewart like gobstopper that no kid is going to (laughs) get. Yeah, I didn't get this. So I'm finding all of this out right now. So. So Buster walks to the other edge of the film strip to jump. Harvey pulls him back after almost making him fall by asking him, thinking about throwing yourself out of the picture, right? And Buster's reaction is, who cares? I wish I was never on Tiny Toons. And a thought hits Harvey's brain so hard we see the spark between his ears light up. You know, they're they're pretty clever with how they kind of write these. Instead of saying, I wish I were dead, I wish... I were never on this series. It, that that the way they did all of this is very very clever. Oh yeah, because I, I mean, as a kid, it, it, I wish I were dead. Coming from a cartoon rabbit, probably. No, you can't say that. No, but it would have been enough for me to tune out as a kid. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Like, yeah, but I wish I were never on Tiny Toons. That's easier to swallow. Absolutely. Yeah. But like to, to where all their values are that like you might as well be dead if you're not famous well, on yeah. TV. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> but also the original script could have said die. Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and then Margaret Lesh pushed it back and was like, we don't do this on Fox because <laughs> Batman ran up against that all the time. Absolutely. Oh, jeez. I do like the effect of like them being on this celluloid strip, though. That was really clever. No. But Harvey tells Buster, you got your wish. There is no Buster Bunny on Tiny Toons. Buster tells him he's nuts and says the Warners would never let him out of his contract. Oh, yeah? Then how come this show wasn't streaming anywhere? Yeah! Put it on me, TV Toons! Yeah, oh, gosh, yes. (laughs) I'm so excited for that, to be honest. As corny as it's going to (laughs) be. Like, is this all crap that we all have on, like, budget DVDs? But it doesn't really matter. Right. No, exactly. Put it somewhere where it's accessible. But as he says this, a lightning bolt strikes the contract in Buster's hand and turns it into dust. Speaking of not getting it, I'm curious if you guys knew this one because Buster says, what are you, Jacoby and Myers? Yeah. Did anyone get that one? Because I sure didn't. No. Isn't that like a, one of those like daytime law firms? It's a personal injury law firm. <laughs> well, Myers is dead now, but it was the first law firm to run TV ads. So you can thank them for every have you been injured in a car accident commercial ever. No. Yeah, I, I'm from Southern California. They they were a California law firm that started that. So it was them, then Larry H. Parker, and all the others that followed. And so, like, when I heard that, I was like, is anybody from the East Coast going to know what Jacoby and Meyer no. are? <laughs> nope. No, I mean, Chad and I had Science and Kirk and Greenberg and Betterman, nope. <laughs> Stephen L. <Nope>. Miles. <laughs> I was, oh, when they added Science, Kirk, and Miles, I was like, no, I don't. I don't like that. Yeah, it was a crossover that I didn't want. No. (laughs) Go back to Baltimore. (laughs) I was literally waiting to say, Will and I had that. And I'm, yes, we are on the same page. Yes, Science and Kirk. Because what kind of, that's the craziest name. And it sounds like a science fiction movie. (laughs) Science and Kirk. Well, you know, Stephen L. Miles got tired of him and he went back to Baltimore. So they're not together anymore. <laughs> what does that tell you? Jeez. I used to work in the same building in Orlando as Morgan and Morgan, who's slowly creeping up the East Coast now. Oh, my God. Morgan and Morgan <laughs> and the, the DC people. Hammer, Mike Slocum. <laughs> there was a, there's a team in Western New York called um, Salino and Barnes. And it actually got, they got parodied on SNL. Um, but that was they, they they're very famous up there. I think one of them died in a plane crash or something like that. So it's always wild to see who what region has these these ambulance I shouldn't say ambulance chasers about about lawyers because someone will probably come find me. About these legal experts. Uh it's always fun to see who has what 
in their region, to be honest. Yeah, but Jacoby and Myers, I think that is the most hyper local Hollywood joke in this whole thing. Totally. Which is saying something. So that's the joke they put in the Tiny Toon special. Uh, and Harvey, in his exaggerated Jimmy Stewart voice, tells Buster, I, 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 I told you, I'm your guardian toon angel, and Buster Bunny, this is your cartoon without you. And pulls Buster into a frame next to a gold-plated sign that now reads, Welcome to Monteville. Now go home. This was like the Biff in, like, Back to the Future film. Yup, I have that note. Oh, okay. (laughs) But as Harvey explains, of course I have that note, but as Harvey (laughs) explains, in a world without Buster around, Monty was put in charge of everything. Well, didn't we just see that happen anyway? Just happens earlier, I guess, but... Yeah. By the way, did anyone see the headline in the newspaper Harvey's reading as he's explaining this? Encino Man. Encino Man wins Best Pick Oscar. Wow. Well, it should have. <laughs> of course, I had to look up which movie from 1992 actually won Best Picture, and it was Unforgiven. I was confused Unforgiven and Tombstone. Unforgiven is the <laughs> one with Clint Eastwood. Yeah. So that's why that one won the Oscar. Yeah. All right. I'm not even going to act like I saw that one. I got to be honest. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's back when they chose movies that people had actually watched. You know, yeah. now it's that uh, scramble yeah. of like, oh, the South Korean film that only came on Tubi for a week. <laughs> and then you have to like find it. Well, I was hoping we turned a corner with Oppenheimer. So we'll see. Uh, yes. Yeah, so let's go back to just nominating blockbusters and movies. Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm with. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm in full agreement here. But Harvey explains, you're not the star of Tiny Toons and Buster demands proof. So Harvey turns on a TV in a nearby store window and we get what looks like a photo negative of the Tiny Toon Adventures portal logo starring Plucky Duck. I'm tiny, I'm toony, I'm just a little loony. And every afternoony, I'm invading your TV. They wrote a whole verse for him. I like it. Yeah, this is great. This this alternate reality version of the theme song is amazing. And my favorite gag is that Babs is always super far in the background and getting hit by Anvil yes. over, and over again. I feel like this is something if Will were a TV writer, this is probably the show he comes up with. I love Plucky. Plucky is my favorite because he's a hater. <laughs> he was always my favorite. Plucky's great. <laughs> We see everybody waiting on Plucky, hand and foot in the green room, including Shirley, Elmira, Gogo, and Calamity Coyote, who's been the stagehand through all of this. I didn't mention him because he doesn't talk, but yeah, Calamity's here. I always forget about Calamity Coyote, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, Babs is still on the show, but clearly hates it, probably because, yeah, all of those anvils, we mentioned that. And we get a glimpse of what the Tiny Toons holiday special looks like with Plucky as the star. And the first thing we notice is Babs is the one who has to wear the big heavy reindeer antlers. Uh Uh-huh. I like that they do the same intro, though. They do the same joke. Hiya, holiday ducksters. I'm Plucky Duck. And I'm Babs Bunny. No No relation. Which should make no sense in this universe. (laughs) And they point it out. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Harvey or God who or whoever's making this reality a reality is showing it to Buster is taking some artistic license, I thought, to get their point across. That's all. Uh, But Plucky says, well, make sense of this. And another anvil falls on her head. Uh, She crawls off as Plucky announces, let's say bye bye to my co-host, because in today's show, I'll be playing all the parts. And Buster has seen enough. He runs onto the set and tells Plucky, stop! can't drop an anvil on Babs. What are you, Goofy? No, I'm Plucky Duck, and I resent that comparison. Say, what are you, a spy from Disney? Uh, I get that. I mean, the best part of that is the follow-up, which I'm sure you have, Mike. But he, when he goes, nice, nice try, try Katzenberg. Katzenberg. Yes, yeah. Fascinating, <laughs> because Jeffrey Katzenberg defects from Disney with Spielberg to form Dream. Uh. It's just a few years later. Yeah, this is before that. He's still with Disney at this. So that's why that joke works. This is two years before. Yeah. I didn't even pick up and notice that. Oh, my God. Yeah. Man, they they really, Warner Brothers was like WCW. They loved taking shots at Disney so much. And meanwhile, Disney's just like, we don't even know you. 
guys fucking exist. <laughs> we, we're not, we don't know. Sorry, like wiping their tears with their uh, $100 bills from a Latin <laughs> that's happening right now. Yup. But see, people forget, though, that the Disney Renaissance didn't kick in until 89. So, like, it might look like Coke versus Pepsi, but it's closer to, like, new Coke versus Pepsi. Like, yep, Disney is true. the big dog, but they haven't been there long. No, they're the recent big dog. Right, and Warner's <laughs> had just as good of a pedigree. It's just the 80s were terrible for everybody. Oh, so, yeah. like, yeah. it made more sense. If they did it now, you'd just be like... Come on, Zaslaw, don't do this. Right, <laughs> yeah. Iger's waiting for you, don't do this. <laughs> what does it say when Deke and Ruby Spears are two of the better, you know, animation <laughs> companies at that point than Disney and Warner Brothers? Oh, goodness, you're right. But Buster gets all doe-eyed. He still doesn't quite understand that he's in a timeline where he never existed, so he asks, don't you know me, Pluck? No, Plucky says, remove this rabbit, and he gives a whistle, and in comes the security guards. Arnold the Pitbull, who grabs Buster by the ears and walks him off the set, followed by his backup, Sneezer, in a matching security guard outfit. By the way, can I just point out one thing? I miss yeah. when every show had an Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> yes. Like, or just someone would do a random Arnold impression. Come along, Vimpy Bunny Boy. Like, I, I, I kind of missed that just because it's so, it was such easy, low-hanging fruit. I kind of missed that. Yeah, no, this was in its prime. It stopped when he became the governator, yeah. because at that point we were like, oh my God, he can do something else. You know, like, yeah. before that, he was just the strong guy. Right. But then yeah. he's like, oh, he's a politician too. It's not funny anymore. You know, yeah. the, the only other show I can really think that was willing to make fun of him was Mad TV when, like, it, Ike Barinholtz would make fun of him or, like, imitate him. But, yeah, I, I, you're right. Right after that, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, and I mean, like, Conan would still go in on him. But we'll get that, what is it, ninth Conan movie eventually, I'm sure. Here's hoping. That Red Sonia movie, too. <laughs> yeah, well, he's going to be Santa next year. What? Oh. He's going to be in a Christmas movie as Santa. Okay. It's real. I I, I believe you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I got nothing to say about it. It's like, <laughs> is it Santa versus Muscles again? Or is that or <laughs> Santa versus Muscles? Oh, Santa I with wish. Muscles, that'd be amazing. <laughs> is that what this is going to be? Because that's the only thing I, I would want to see him in. Um, it's going to uh, be like one of those like Netflix Santa Russell. But what was the Goldberg one? The one where Goldberg was the killer Santa. <laughs> uh, Santa Slay, S-L-A-Y. Yep. Oh, and I'm going to be upset. So this Schwarzenegger movie where he's Santa is called The Man with the Bag. It's going to be like Amazon and MGM Studios. Oh my gosh. Twitter's going to be so obnoxious. It's no, He's Santa and then like he enlists the help of Alan Richson. The guy playing oh. Reacher. Well, you didn't say Kevin Hart, so I'm on board. <laughs> Who? The, in the, on the Reacher, on the Jack Reacher show that they got going now. That oh. guy. So another giant dude. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm staying off Twitter that entire month that it's out. I, I do all <laughs> We're still a year away, I think. I think this doesn't come out till 25, so. Well, I've time. got a cold that whole month. Okay. Nothing has legs anymore. You just have to stay off for a weekend. Like, the weekend uh, it okay. drops... And then by Monday, no one yep. will talk about it anymore. <laughs> it's over. It's over. We're the only people who mentioned Urkel Christmas thing in like months. I was looking forward to it and I still haven't watched it. Neither have they I. made you pay for it. Yeah. Like they, they could have put it on Max and they made it VOD for cost. And that angered me more than anything. That's that's when you get a Plex account. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yup. <laughs> but yeah. Buster now turns to Sneezer, who says, you gotta know who I am, but the little guy corrects him. Name Sneezer, hit the road! <laughs> and boots him out of the building. Sleezer. Sleezer, I love that. Buster lands next to Harvey and says, I feel like I'm in a bad episode of Quantum Leap. And I promise I didn't plan these two episodes being back-to-back -back before <laughs> rewatching this. Serendipity. But... Now we're in front of Acme University, or as it's known in this timeline, 
Montana Max's Business Luniversity. Inside, Monty is seen making an announcement on some TV monitors in the school's hallway, and wow, he's even got Alt Biff's slicked back hair. Says, as you know, it is Christmas Eve, and in respect of that, I'm offering you a shorter day. Only 18 hours of classes. So yeah, it's greater high school. It's not really university. Then he puts on his ski goggles and said he's heading to Aspen with Morgan Fairchild. Oh, is he going to get into that accident again? Sounds like it. We never find out. But Buster runs through the school to find Harvey standing outside his homeroom. And inside, he's shocked to find there are TV monitors hooked up to every desk. And Shirley is asking the teacher how she can become a successful actress. And the teacher is supposed to be our next celebrity cameo. Madonna. Just wear your underwear on the outside and Warners will give you a multi-million dollar deal. <laughs> See, this 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 reference I think we all would have gotten. But yes. It, it, I think if you were around in the 90s, there were two easy targets. And it was Madonna and Michael Jackson. So like every single show had one or the other, like every other episode. Oh, yeah. But also, it's interesting, you know, just at this time to think of, you know, Madonna, because this is like the most risque joke in the whole thing. Yeah. And it's because they're prime time. I have to imagine they got away with it. because it's. Oh, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Yep. She didn't have. What movies did she have with Warner Brothers at that time? No, Warner's was her record label. Oh, OK. Never mind. She was on Sire, which is oh, a subsidiary okay. of Warner Brothers. So okay. that's where she was going with that. She was never really a, like movies, Desperately Seeking Susan, Dick Tracy, and yeah. the one with Guy Ritchie that ruined their marriage. <laughs> that's like all I think of. <laughs> 1992. Well, she would have just been in a league of their own. Yeah. Oh, okay. Avita was just around the corner. Just around the corner. Yep. Buster shuts the door and says, "Ugh, okay, man. Madonna in 1992 would have made a perfectly fine professor. I'd be in that class all day. (laughs) Yep. But Buster is very confused, so Harvey has to explain it to him again. Grabs Buster's ear and shouts in it, "You were never on Tiny Toons. You never existed, and everything is different now." Get it? Got it. Good. You don't do that to me. Well, and Harvey yelling here is probably where Dan Castellana's voice sounds the most recognizable. Mm -hmm. He does a fine Jimmy Stewart impression, but when he was screaming in Buster's ear, I could hear his plain old yelling voice, almost like sober Barney. Yep. So now Buster asks, if I don't exist, but what about, and before he can get the question out, Harvey finishes it, Babs? And Buster fumbles with his words a bit here, so Harvey helps again. You want to know if she replaced you? I don't think replacing him is the right word here if Buster never existed, but maybe that's why he replies, kinda? And Harvey points down the hall to a door labeled Film Library and says, go find out for yourself. So Buster does. He opens the door to a very dark stairwell, which leads down to three doors that look like prison doors with a sign that calls them viewing rooms. He opens the door to find Babs alone in a small private theater watching holiday-themed Looney Tunes starring Porky Pig and Pepe Le Pew. And a meet, a meet for Merry Christmas, Petunia. I have a, g- a, g- a present for you. The m- 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 moon. Both voiced here by Greg Burson, who at the time was the voice of most classic Looney Tunes characters after Mel Blanc died. He also took over Yogi Bear after Dawes Butler's death. Dawes was Greg's mentor, he said, so that's no surprise. Interesting. Interesting. But Babs is sitting alone in the dark, letting out an audible sigh while watching these, and she is dressed, this is another It's a Wonderful Life reference, like Donna Reed in that alternate reality in that movie. Because she became a spinster. Yes. She's got the horn-rimmed glasses and the pillbox hat. For some reason, I thought it was Adrian from Rocky. It does kind of. Well, I mean, the same concept. I mean, Adrian is probably her outfit is probably also based on Donna Reed and it's wonderful. Yeah, Yeah, it's that spinster outfit. Oh, God forbid. Glasses and a tight waist coat and a hat. Gets up and says to herself, wish I had a co-star who cared about me and looks up to see Buster standing in front of her. Of course, she doesn't know who he is. So she simply says, hello. Hi. 
I'm a Buster Bunny. Hi, I'm Babs Bunny. No relation. Hey, that's the first time that ever made sense. Well, enjoy it while it lasts, kid, because it doesn't anymore. Mm -mm. Because of Tiny Toons Luniversity. But we already talked about it. It's just so. the most strange thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just very odd. Anyway, Babs asks Buster, do I know you from somewhere? And Buster says, yes, we're the stars of Tiny Toon Adventures. No, dude. It takes Buster less time to figure out how a world can exist without him than it takes George Bailey. So I'll give him that, I guess. But until he can figure it out, Babs tells him he's crazy. Plucky's the star. Who are you? You're stalking me. Leave me alone. And she runs out of the theater. I was wondering about this, like this, again, prime time, this idea of stalking a celebrity. Like, I don't think that was in the popular culture very heavily, was it? Like, was there a big publicized thing about stalking celebrities? Probably. Who was, um, who was from my sister, Sam? Because she has the stalker, unfortunately, that killed her. Oh, that's there right. There were like oh, stalkers yeah. every, you know, they, it would pop up, but it, like not as big as it is like now. Yeah, but it just felt like very heavy to shout that out. Like it was kind of, oh man. Was that was that line for line from like it's a wonderful life, or is that completely different? It's not completely different, but I mean the gist of it is the same. Okay. By the way, the actress I was talking about was Rebecca Shaver. Okay. I'm just like yeah. I remember Pam Dauber and I'm like, no, she's still alive. I forgot her yeah. name, unfortunately. Yep. Uh but Buster watches her run out of the theater and Harvey asks him, had enough? And he has. Buster begs him, please let me back. I take it all back. And Harvey says he'll see what he can do. And they've got to wait a couple minutes, though. For what? Commercials. Mm -hmm. What a place to cut to commercial. Right when it's supposed to be the end. But I guess this episode was going for a bit longer of an act three. When we return, Buster repeats his wish that he wants to go back. And we see Harvey's ears spark lightning again, but this time he disappears. Buster keeps shouting for him, and then we hear Babs off screen shout, Buster! And there she is, dressed in her normal puffy-sleeved 90s sweater and skirt. You know, I kind of missed the glasses and hat there, but I understand. Bit too early in the 90s for that look to return, but... Buster is relieved to see Babs, asks, you know who I am? And she replies, this is no time for some tired American Express card parody. Do you remember those American Express commercials? No. They were mostly, like, I want to say mid to late 70s, early 80s. Mel Blanc had one, but it was, uh, it showed, like, their name on the card. It's, it's. Was it Mel Blanc, like. Is it like him or was he like yeah no he's in a restaurant it's like it's characters like you wouldn't recognize out in public it's like do you know me i'm the voice of bugs bunny but people don't know that that's why i carry my american express i don't leave home without it oh. did lorenzo music do one <laughs> uh jim davis did one did he really with garfield in the commercial yeah so All right. but that was the gist it's just like people you may not recognize but you know their work ah oh, okay Okay, that's kind of clever. That's yeah. Kind of smart yeah. But as times change, you're still going to have to ask, can I also see some ID? Um, this isn't signed and I don't know you. Yeah. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> <laughs> but that's all Buster needs to hear. He yells out a yippee and he jumps for joy so high he leaps out of the film strip, but back down again, gives Babs a big squeezing hug and runs out of the theater. The Acme Acre sign is back. Buster gives it a big old, it's a wonderful lifey. Merry Christmas, you great, big, beautiful Acme Acres, you. And just jumping through the snow, continuing the shout, yippee! Mm, happy holidays, you radiant rabbit hole, you. All as Babs just tries to keep up with him. Even pulls Steven Spielberg out from off screen and wishes him a happy Hanukkah, you magnificent mogul, you. <laughs> He's got an E.T. <laughs> hat on. It's so funny. He always yeah. has an E.T. hat on whenever they yeah. animate Spielberg. I love it. Kisses the camera lens and wishes us season's greetings, you awesome audience. Followed by a shot of the planet Earth in space that gets hugged and smooched by a giant buster who echoes Feliz Navidad, you pretty planet, you. Glad he appears to not be crushing our houses, his arms stretching out over the Atlantic Ocean, but from north to south, so we're okay. 
Babs finally catches up to him, slaps a hand over his mouth and says, okay, we got it. Now let's go. Monty special really. And her sentence is finished by Plucky on the set shouting. Stinks. It stinks. He's talking about the script. He's telling Monty himself, the script is terrible. It has lines like away to the bank. I drove in a dash, opened a CD and deposited cash. <laughs> He asks Monty, who nervously turns to two TV executives and says, I like it, don't you? But Fran, the exec, says to her partner, Edward, he is so lost. And Edward replies, yes, he is. And then Plucky quits again, followed by Elmira, who waddles in wearing a giant red dress and pearls and shouts, I don't want to play Leona Helmsley. Another very 90s reference. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember hearing it like Saturday Night Live or whatever. Just like any any like adult joke thing that was happening. And then I said, I don't know who this person is, but everybody thinks it's hilarious. She's a really rich, mean woman. She was like a real life Cruella DeVille. Yeah. She uh, taxes are for the little people. That's a yeah. sentence she said. I think I always just assumed she was an actress or like a sitcom star or something like that. Like nope. with that name, Leona Helmsley or whatever it is. She was really in the news right around this time, but she's also like, is the kind of humor that if you're going to make fun of her, you're also probably going to have a joke about Zsa, Zsa slapping that cop. Oh, like yeah. it was, it was golden girls humor right, kind of right, because yeah. Leona Helmsley got sentenced around this time. Like she was mean to her staff. She wasn't paying taxes. She wasn't paying her yeah. employees. She was kind of like an heiress. So that's just early nineties pop culture. Yeah. Her husband owned the empire state building. There we go. Whoa. Did she really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. That a girl. But. <laughs> I think. Well, no. Apparently not. Apparently After not. Told nah. Did, nah. So. Nah. But for her owning the, you know what, I'm done. <laughs> Bye, Leona. <laughs> but from the back of the theater, Buster and Babs return as Bab tells everyone, we found him. And Monty asks, does that mean I have to put him in the show? And Fran, the exec, tells him, no, because you're fired. Buster, you're rehired to the cheers from everyone else in the cast, including the celebrities like Sharon Shatner, and even the Blue Grinch is here now. Buster proudly marches down the aisle and stops to tell Monty, don't worry, there's a part for you. You're the star. Ooh, the star. Monty likes the sound of that. But before we pay it off, Buster tells everyone to set up for the big finale. Cher is the first to answer, says, you got it, babe. Which... Reminds Bab she's supposed to be mad at Buster and asks him, what were you whispering to her about anyway? And Cher tells her, oh, he wanted to know what to get you for Christmas. And Babs asks what she suggested. And Buster dips Babs and gives her a big old smooch, which makes her melt into a puddle, except for her eyes, which are now just floating and blinking in midair over the puddle. That's now the rest of her. Seeing that gift exchange reminds Fran the exec to ask Edward, hey, what did you get me? And he replies, the greatest gift of all, my dear, the gift of charity. And he swipes the stack of cash she's holding and stuffs it in a donation box. But who's holding the donation box? It's Whoopi Goldberg with Billy Crystal and Robin Williams. I'm just here for comic relief. Oh, my favorite part. Is, is Robin Williams is dressed as Peter Pan flying behind them because Spielberg had just directed Hook. Yep, that's it. That's, that's the joke. joke. This was a year <laughs> after Hook came out. Whoopi explains, I'm just here for comic relief. And now I get it. Again, that that I wasn't comic relief kind of phasing out at that point. Or was it still going? I think it was still going. I feel like I wouldn't have gotten that joke as a kid. I did only because I remember staying up real late and realizing, oh, all of these guys cussed. Yeah, I can imagine. Because <laughs> it was like the late night HBO comic relief special. But uh, So we cut back to the stage where Buster and Babs are in the spotlight standing in front of a one horse open sleigh and sing something else. If troubles come our way to spoil the holiday, it doesn't really matter because it's you. If you deck the heart and handfuls fall, it, it doesn't, doesn't really matter because it's you. 
this is a cute little song everyone has a line in and to the point of it's no matter what happens to Christmas it doesn't really matter cause there's you Aww. if there wasn't so many interruptions like Bob Hope is still here trying to riff off Sneezer this would be a good addition to your Christmas playlist but it doesn't really work on its own without all these dialogue bits I think the intro song would be a good addition to the playlist. Yeah, if you can find it. Although the great visual gag with the the little Christmas tree from the Charlie yeah. Brown Christmas, and then they turn and they look like Peanuts characters. Yeah, they them. have their faces drawn on there. That's awesome. That was kind of disturbing, actually, but I <laughs> but I enjoyed it. But as the song starts to wrap up, here we see Monty scream, get me down from here! And the camera pans up a tall Christmas tree to discover he is the star. He's dressed up like the literal star on top of the tree. What I want to know is, his legs are inside two points of the star. I had to think how he was placed on top of that tree. (laughs) Not comfortably. Yeah. My teamsters. By very pissed off on the Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, Elmira climbs a rope to the top of the tree, holds out some mistletoe, and declares, Kiss me, baby. That's it. Monty's a literal star. It's silly. Back down on the sleigh, Babs tells Buster, If you ever feel like a loser again, remember, no tune is a failure who has friends. Yawn. <laughs> As the sleigh takes off, the horse can fly and is carrying the sleigh behind it like it's a reindeer? Oh no, the horse got into the magic corn feed. I hate when that happens. But that wraps things up. We go back to the theater, see Harvey standing there by himself, and he looks at us and says, not bad. Then he rips off what we're about to find out is a fake head and costume to reveal it's Bugs Bunny. Oh, amateurs. So, I always kind of took early on that all the Tiny Toons kids, they were the children of, like, Bugs Bunny and, like, Daffy. I always thought that they were supposed to be children. Is that not the case? I had thought that at first, and then they explained it as you watch through the series that they are their mentors, their teachers of comedy. Oh. That's why Acme Luniversity exists. But someone else clearly had that idea, which is why Disney's The Descendants is a franchise. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Oh, my goodness. We were knee deep in that for a few years. But uh, I have a special credit for Bugs's voice. It was usually Greg Burson doing it during the show. But according to the Tiny Toons wiki, Bugs in this special for that last line is voiced by Noel Blank, Mel's son. Hmm. Huh. And he did do a few of his dad's characters after he died, including Elmer Fudd most prominently. But apparently they brought him in for this one line. And if that's true, that's a fantastic Easter egg to cap off the regular series run. It would, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So technically, Bugs Bunny would have had the final line in Tiny Toons, the original run. Well, no, because right at the end, there's always the gag credit, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. This one says, stop watching these credits and go buy us a really nice gift. Followed by Gogo, who has the last line. He wishes us all season's greetings. I do want to give a shout out. The one thing at the beginning, uh, you know, as they're coming into uh, Acme Acres and then out here, you know, over the credits, the Christmas score that they have put together. I love just the, the arrangement is fantastic. It just it has a classic feel and it, it really puts you in that Christmas mood, both the you know, beginning and the end. So you just get it all a nice wraparound. Yeah, the intro, it's just they added sleigh bells and they changed the lyrics. But the end here, it, it is a little more festive than that. Any final thoughts on It's a Wonderful Tiny Toons Christmas special? It's the perfect series finale for a show that's on the bubble yeah like i've seen this before where it's like you don't know if you're coming back next season so we're gonna do the whole plot where like if the if the star goes through with it then it drastically changes everything but (laughs) if they don't then whatever it it gave you some drama for a while so it's like they don't know where they are in the production cycle 
If they were canceled by this point, it's great. If they were going to carry on, it's great because it feels like they were about to get a second wind. Buster's coming back. He's jazzed up to keep going with this thing. But also, like, if it ended, it ended. You know, like, Mm -hmm. there's no cliffhanger. There's no, like, there's no tease of what was to come that we may have missed out on. I think it was like the only problem I would have had would have been if bugs was the final word. Cause it does, it counts mm. it all from a legacy perspective, but it makes it come across like enterprise. I don't know if you guys are <laughs> oh, Trekkies, no, yeah. but like the problem with Star Trek enterprise, which has, it's never been forgiven nope. is the series finale turns out to be a holodeck program from the next generation yeah oh i heard about that yeah so basically it spits in the face of this cast that's been together for like four (laughs) seasons it's like you know what your whole swan song this is riker's episode (laughs) no you're all in a snow globe (laughs) yes enterprise was uh scott bacula yep yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. can't get away from scott bacula this episode weird (laughs) Well, I'll just say for me, I had never seen this before. So this was a first time watch for me. And I watched it twice, you know, in preparation. And it was just, it was so enjoyable both times to where like, you know, again, yes, it has some very, you know, early 90s celebrities, right? Like it has those references, but the humor itself is timeless. And the meta nature of it and the fact that, you know, It's a Wonderful Life has endured, has become such a part of the, you know, the Christmas season pop culture. Like it just, it works so well uh, that it, it doesn't feel dated to where I'm just like, oh, well, that's a nice little artifact. Like it's actually funny in this day and age. And so I I really, I look forward to sharing it with my kids, their reaction, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I thought it was pretty good. You know, I I didn't really see anything too offensive that would just be like, oh my gosh, it's not like those Paul Fusco specials (laughs) that you and I have been watching. Yeah. this This is pretty good. Like I would, if I were to have like a Christmas mixtape, I'd probably put this in it somewhere. Yeah, I'm very glad they didn't try and stretch it out to an hour. Oh, gosh. Especially since they had that primetime spot. Uh, It does kind of end abruptly, but I feel like it was already stretched kind of thin to begin with. And if they tried to make it longer, it would have been a bad time. I feel like as soon as they come back to from the final commercial break, it, it it feels like they were really, really running out of ideas. So they just kind of started stretching a lot towards the end. Yeah. I, that's actually a note I had, but yeah, they, it, it felt like eh, you probably could have gotten this done in like maybe half the time. <laughs> yeah. I feel like they must have been writing it like into late into the night, and then they they were watching Jay Leno on the Tonight Show, or was it still Johnny Carson at this point? What did oh, he do? It's Leno at this point. Yeah, because but... Johnny Leno was the permanent guest host. Johnny didn't really work those last few years. His yeah. name was mm. just still on the show. Right. Well, that's why I think like the Leona Helmsley joke comes in. They're just like, let's just uh, throw yeah. with this guy's joke. Yeah. Yeah, Jacoby and Myers. Yeah. But... <laughs> let's, let's throw in a Patty Hearst joke while we're at it. <laughs> I mean, they might have well. Maybe we'll make a Jim Jones joke. That'll be great. <laughs> but all in all, this was a pretty good time. It, it's good for what I like to call a decorating special. Something quick to put on while you're getting out all your Christmas stuff whenever you do that. Yeah, I can see that. But thank you all for tuning in with me to cover this special. This was a blast. You're very yeah, thank you. It was great revisiting Tiny Tunes. And if people want to replace you with Urkel, the wacky podcast guest, where can they find you on the internet, Chad? Well, I think you're better off getting Urkel, the wacky podcast guest, instead <laughs> of me, to be honest. Oh. Uh, look me up, HorrorMovieBarbecue.com, and social media at HorrorMovieBarbecue. Will. Uh, westweekever.com and William B. West on all social media. And Adam. Well, I am at Hoju Coolander on all the socials. I do have to say, if you enjoyed William Bruce West's total recall of all things network television, all those details, you can get a whole bunch of it on our podcast we do together. Remember that show. 
Like, let me say it correctly. Remember that show? There it is. Uh, where we talk about all the obscure or forgotten uh, t- TV shows of the 80s and 90s. Uh, we we do a deep dive. We even take a chance at how can we revive it in our segment called Show Doctors. Can we extend it? Can we keep it alive? But yeah, it's just a fantastic conversation every couple of weeks. So go find it and subscribe. Go find it. I'll make it easy for you all to find it. It's in the show notes. And all of those links are, you can find those and me at adventcalendar.house. And that's all for this Christmas in July, folks. I will be back in December with another dozen specials. I've already got it mapped out. It's going to be fun. So till next time, for Chad, Will, and Adam, from the film strip shaped edge of reality itself, this is Mike Westfall reminding you to please mind the icy patch and no tune is a failure who has friends. Thank you for being a friend. Good night. Seasons greetings! And so